Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We are glad that you are here uh, to worship with us. We get to worship a risen Savior together. We're so thankful that we get to come together as one body uh, and worship Him together this morning. Just a couple of announcements. Actually, there are several announcements. First, I want to announce, uh, Ms. Susan Singletary told me this morning that the uh, United Methodist Women donated 1,024 Tide Pods uh, to the women's shelter. Women's shelter? Is that right? To the women's shelter this last month. Homeless shelter. Homeless shelter. Thank you, Ms. Barbara. Uh, for the, the laundry ministry stuff. And uh, so 1,024 Tide Pods. That's pretty impressive. So we're very thankful for them and their, their ministry. But also they're kicking off a new one. Uh, their elder cheer. You'll see the list in the bottom of your bulletin. You'll find boxes in the fellowship hall for you to donate these items into. So uh, do that as you can. We also want to uh, announce Operation Christmas Child. And I'm going to let Steve make a, a, an announcement about that one. just want to uh, emphasize it, tell you next Sunday's the last day, and um, if you really want a box, you can ask Kim. She might be able to scrounge one or two up somewhere in the building, but most of the boxes have been taken, so if you got a box, um, fill it up, bring it back next week, put, put your check in it for all that, um, or if you still want to do one you haven't, then most likely do it online, but if, if you really want a box, talk to her, but this is a great ministry. We'll talk about a little bit more about it in the service later, but um, it's a great opportunity for us to give uh, to, to children who may have nothing else otherwise and also to tell the truth, to tell the gospel. And so it's a beautiful ministry. Amen. So again, if you want to do one virtual, you go online, you'll see Operation Christmas Child on our website. Uh, you just click on that, and then you can do one virtually. It's $25 to do a virtual box. If you have a, taken a box with you, and, and don't forget to fill it up and bring it back, but put the $9 in there as well uh, for shipping for that one uh, if you're doing an actual box. Uh, also, we just got back from Houma, Louisiana on our mission trip, and we had a great time. We were down there serving a couple of folks, and I'm going to tell you more about that here in the near future. But I will tell you, Miss Debbie sitting up here on the front row, I've refused to go on mission trips again unless I could take Debbie Bell and Terry Glass because they outworked me the whole time uh, that we were there. They did fantastic. So when you see them, thank them for their service. I was very, very pleased uh, to be able to travel with them. And then final announcement, we just received this this morning, so we don't have a whole lot of information on it, but uh, Gerald Ringler, who used to apparently used to attend here, uh, has passed away at the age of 90 in Charlotte. So we just wanted to make that announcement this morning that, that we had received that uh, email. And I believe that's it. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for this glorious day that you've given us. This is the day that you have made, and we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we ask that you would come fill our time, that you would move in us, that we would fill your presence. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing and rejoice together this morning. <clears throat>
it nice to have a nice big choir back up there again? You may be seated. One announcement I forgot, and I apologize for that. Today is Pledge Sunday, and so um, we will be doing our pledges today. And so we have Roger here. Roger's our finance guy uh, for the church. And so Roger's here only to help those that need help with maybe doing the online giving. So if you need help setting that up, uh, Roger's sitting up here. You can come find him. He'll be able to give you a hand with that uh, and get that process set up. It's pretty easy. So if you would like to do the online giving instead of uh, writing checks and those type things, he can help you set that up. Let's go to God in prayer again this morning. Heavenly Father, again, we give you all of the glory because you deserve it. You are the creator of all things, the creator of the universe, and yet you're our individual creator, someone who wants a personal relationship with us. And though that blows our mind, Lord, we are so honored to be in a relationship with you. Your grace and mercy is new every morning, and you pour it out abundantly upon us. And we give you thanks, and we praise your name and give adoration to you. Lord, we come this morning praying for those around the world who are suffering, especially those who are suffering on your behalf, those who have been kidnapped in Haiti, and now those who have been kidnapped in Nigeria, that you, would, that you would be with them, that you would give them strength, that you would give them power, and Lord, that you would give them peace. We pray for their release. We pray for their... Uh, captives, those that have taken them captive, I mean, we pray that you would turn their heart, that they would have a divine encounter with you, Lord. Lord, we pray for this church as we continue to do the missions you've called us to do. We pray that that mission would be clear to us, the vision that you've given us, that we can go out and do ministry together in one accord, in a community around us that so desperately needs it, that we might be your hands and feet that we might carry the gospel so that others can see it. Lord, I give you thanks for this church. The people love it. I ask that you would bless them and bless their week. Right now, Lord, we lift up Steve and the message that he's going to give today, that the spirit would be moving within him, that the words that are said would pierce our hearts because they come from you, and that we might hear you clearly and be able to respond to it. Lord, this morning as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, we ask that it would just be a sign and symbol of our adoration for you, that we would be singing your praises. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our choir is going to continue to lead us this morning in worship. And the the anthem that they've chosen comes from Micah 6. And it's, What Should I Bring Before the Lord? And I think that's appropriate for our stewardship campaign as we come to its culmination this morning.
time, we want to invite our children to head to Children's Church. Thank you, both choirs. That was beautiful. What a wonderful expression of the passage that we've been looking at. As you're able, if you would please stand in honor of reading God's holy word. This morning's passage of scripture is the same as last week's. It's Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, and reads this way. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of God for the gathered people of God. Please be seated. Um, Justice is a critically important topic, of course, and one that um, is, is so vital for our day-to-day, and one that answers lots and lots of our questions. But the, the issue is, what's the best system of, of justice? Which system and which approach, which philosophy is, uh, is going to be most just? I want to Uh, start off this morning with an illustration of an experience at a time in the history of our country when systemic racism was a real thing, that it was a part of, uh, it was a very substantive part of what our government was all about, what our our country was about. It was back in the days right after World War II in the 1940s when uh, all of our men were coming back from World War II and the black men were coming back as well. They had fought for the United States, but they weren't allowed to participate in Major League Baseball. And so it's how Major League Baseball actually transcended that barrier. And it happened with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and uh, it happened with the person of Jackie Robinson. And uh, during that time, uh, one of, well... Branch Ritchie, who was the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers, he said, you know, who is it that I want to use? Which person am I going to choose to make this big move, to make this change in American baseball? And he looked through all sorts of people, and he came up with lots of good baseball players. That wasn't the issue, but they had to have specific qualifications as well beyond that. And Jackie Robinson was an officer in the military. He would fought in World War II. But one of the things that had also happened was that he'd gotten into trouble. And the reason he got into trouble legally in the military was because he had defied some racist um, problems within the military and, and some prejudice that he had experienced. But uh, Branch Ritchie, um, and I, I love that I, I watched um, 42 again this past week um, to kind of refresh my memory about it, which talks about uh, Jackie Robinson and how he was number 42 and how he... Um, came to the Brooklyn Dodgers, and, and Branch Ritchie, he said, well, how did I pick Jackie Robinson? And this is way, how he responded. He said, Jackie's 
He's a Methodist. And I'm a Methodist. And God's a Methodist. In other words, he knew that Jackie had the strength of character to be willing to stand up for um, what was right and what was true. But the other thing that he knew was he wanted somebody that he believed would also have the strength to be able to stand and not fight back when injustice was um, done to him. And so Jackie Robinson is the one that he picked. Now, there's all sorts of debate as to when it happened, whether it was 1947, the first year, or 1948, where it happened, or where it happened. But in those, those first years, um, the team went through all sorts of things together with Jackie Robinson that really made them different and to stand out. And this first thing um, happened um, in relation to Pee Wee Reese. And Pee Wee Reese was one of the players. He was from Kentucky. And it's believed that it happened in Cincinnati in 1947. And Cincinnati is near Kentucky where his home was. And so a lot of his own people would be there. And Pee Wee Reese was talking to another player. And the player said, well, we live in a democracy, so everybody has the right to play. Um, and then Pee Wee said to him, though, well, and, and, okay, I'm going to read a curse word, okay? So get, brace yourself. I think it's an appropriate one, and, and it's one that's in the Bible, so I, I'm okay, all right? Um, well, that's true, Pee Wee Reese said, but Jackie's catching special hell because he's the only black player. Maybe we ought to do something to make it more equal. And Pee Wee Reese, he noticed that there that day in warm-ups that the crowd was particularly attacking Jackie, Jackie Robinson. They were particularly um, ugly in the ways in which they were yelling at him and, and giving him a hard time. And so while they were warming up, he walked across from his position at shortstop, came over to Jackie and began to talk to him. And if you've seen the movie, it's a great depiction of it. But he comes over and he begins to talk to him. And then he stops and he puts his arm around Jackie and he just stands there for a long pause and lets everybody watch this popular baseball player, Pee Wee Reese, embrace a black man in public in the middle of baseball. And that expression did make things more equal. Now, another thing that happened uh, during that same time period, again, there's not certainty as to which particular day or, or place it was, but um, they believe it was in Cincinnati. Well, we know that it was in Cincinnati because the Cincinnati manager was being extremely ugly to Jackie and calling him all sorts of names and telling, you know, saying all sorts of ugly things to him. When one of the other players finally had had enough, and he got out of, his, out of the dugout, walked across the field, went up to the player, and, or the manager, he knew him, and, and he said, the only reason you're doing this is because Jackie can't fight back, and you know it. Why don't you pick a fight with somebody who can fight back? And uh, he stood up for him. He stood up for him in, in a significant way, and what everybody that was a part of it um, uh, would say later is that those two incidences were the things that cemented them together as a team and made them the men that they needed to be. Those 30 men became a unit and a family. Why? Because they heard, not, they didn't just hear, they saw Jackie's story being lived out in front of them. And so they were a part of that story. And what are we? Who are we? We are the people of the greatest story. The most humble of advocates has come for us so that we can understand what justice truly is. All right, um, last week uh, we looked at uh, the four major secular approaches to justice, and, one of, and we're gonna, I'm going to review a little bit because there's no way it's got to be brought back to your memory, but, but these are the four major uh, secular approaches to justice, and we know, <clears throat> we know that as Americans we like to pick and choose. You know, We like to go to the buffet, pick a little of that and a little of this, but the purest forms of these are in this way. They are, they're naturalistic. They're atheistic. Um, they don't believe in God. They believe in an evolutionary, natural expre expression. And uh, the libertarian, for instance, the first one, I think we got it up there. It, their main focus is freedom. Uh, the liberal focus is fairness. The utilitarian is happiness. And the postmodern or critical thinking one is, 
revolves around power. Now, one of the things that's important to understand is because they don't believe in a lawgiver, somebody who's an objective moral uh, umpire that, that gives direction here, um, they have to come up with their own moral precepts. And so they have to just uh, bring them, pop them out of thin air. If morality is culturally determined and relative, as they say, how can they make emphatic moral claims? They really can't with any real authority and with credibility make the kinds of claims that they do to morality. All right, again, I'm going to review the postmodern or critical thinking real quickly. All differences in wealth and power are solely due to systemic prejudice or social structures that oppress people. What that means is that they believe that individual actions, differences of culture, or abilities have no impact on disparities. The claim is that four categories determine wealth and power when it comes to any differences in wealth and power. And that would be race, gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity. The next thing I'd summarize uh, with this idea is that language is used to control power. Language doesn't just describe reality, it literally creates reality. Now, one of the things we got to remember is that, that all four of these secular perspectives have good questions. They have good issues that they want to resolve, that they're pursuing. It's just that uh, we believe that ultimately the biblical perspective of justice is much better, much fuller, much more robust, and satisfying. Um, one of the things that I also want to say is that there are always elements of truth within all things that unfortunately are false. And one of the truths is that language is powerful, isn't it? Language has a huge impact. God spoke creation into existence. He's created you in his image. So you have the ability to speak and, power, and, and change things, change people change environments in a, in a positive, redemptive way. But it's up to us to use that power and that strength. And it is a real power, um, but it's not one that should be um, isolated and destroyed. Quite the contrary. What we as Americans believe is that the free market of ideas is just as important a, as anything else. We th believe that if we debate different perspectives, that ultimately the truth begins to rise. It's the same with the Christian faith. The Christian faith has never been concerned about imposing things on other people, but rather we believe that the truth of the gospel is like cream, and it will come to the top. It will rise to the top. The best flavor, the best of all that's good will come to the top. The truth will prevail. Jesus will prevail, ultimately, because he is the truth. And so we're not afraid of other religions or other philosophies and perspectives. We just want the freedom to be able to speak the truth in the way in, in which we're not constrained. All right, so language is an important issue. Then lastly, human rights are not positive, but barriers to justice from this perspective. And again, free speech is one of the main reasons for that. Group identity determines rights and guilt. The only way to bring justice is by social policy or by laws. Now, what law made Pee Wee Reese walk across that field and put his arm around Jackie Robinson? There was no law that did that. There is no law that can do that. Ultimately, I believe that the only thing that can do that is the Holy Spirit of God. And our willingness to surrender to him as he speaks to us, as he prompts us, as he guides, as he shapes and he molds us. All right, we're going to look at the five biblical principles of justice that answer all the concerns of secular justice, but I believe in a more compelling and thorough manner. And we'll review the first two, but I'm, I, I've changed one of the scriptures, and, and there'll be a little bit of, of a, a fresher look to it. The first one is this, I belong to a community, so I choose to be generous with those in need. I belong to a community, so I choose to be generous with those in need. Jesus told us that we're to love our neighbors as ourselves. That includes people that we consider to be enemies. Why? Because they're still there. They're still our neighbors. And according to Jesus, we're supposed to love them. And we're supposed to approach them with generous hearts. All right, Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. 
This is a different passage about gleaning, but very similar. Um, when you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap to the very edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not strip your vineyard bare or gather its fallen grapes. Leave them for the poor and the resident alien. I am the Lord your God. Now remember last week we, we had some of that same speech and we have it again here. He puts a, an exclamation point on it. He's saying, guys, I'm the one that made you. I'm the creator. I am God. I am your God. I'm not just somebody that's, that's thought something out of thin air and given you this nice little idea. I'm the one that owns those grapes that have fallen to the ground. And I'm saying that you've got to leave the perimeter for people that are struggling, that find themselves in a downcast, difficult position, for them to have a way to honorably provide for themselves. They're my grapes. You do it the way I've created and called you to do it. So he's called us to be generous because we're a part of this community. He wants us to reflect his generous heart to those that are in need. We love people regardless of an identity group. Critical theory, there's no room for forgiveness or reconciliation between us or between God and others. For one, they don't believe it. In its purest form, they don't believe in God, and so there's no reconciliation available there. But there's no reconciliation within humanity either. The groups don't cross. There's no way for them to, to socialize. They, it literally reinforces prejudices rather than overcome prejudices. And the only thing that ultimately is going to help us bring justice is the grace and the mercy of God that not only helps us get, create good policy, but also puts forgiveness in our hearts and enables us to love and to cherish other people. The second point I want to share with you is this. Everyone must be treated with equality, dignity, and honor. With equality, dignity, and honor. It would seem that this idea is a given, but with critical theory, justice is slippery. Because of identity groups, um, what's considered just is debatable. There is a hierarchy that they operate by, and so you have to operate by that hierarchy to determine what is right and just. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 15 and 16, do not act unjustly when deciding a case. Do not be partial to the poor or give preference to the rich. Judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not jeopardize your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Again, he puts that exclamation point in there, guys. Again, you know, this isn't just some, you know, play fun idea. I'm the one who is God. And you're supposed to listen to what I'm commanding you to do. The scales of justice have to be blind. Do not be partial to the poor or give preference to to the rich. This is the way justice ultimately has to be implemented. Without it, nobody feels secure. There's no sense of, of, of peace resolved. Um, it's exactly the opposite of cr what critical theory would say. Critical theory would demand that the poor be shown favoritism in and before the law. Laws should be crafted to reverse financial and power dynamics. Here's the problem. If the laws would, would rectify all inequities in income and power, then ultimately what we have done is just switch the people that are now in the oppressive role and the people that are in the oppressed role. And now you've got to switch back. In other words, you've just created turmoil for eternity in any kind of government. There is no way to bring reconciliation between us as peoples um, but instead, you create conflict, you create anxiety, and you create an endless sense of insecurity. Now, what is, is, it's also interesting that he says, do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not jeopardize your neighbor's life. What is it that our culture has done? Ultimately, that's what we do. That's kind of our pastime now, is to slander one another and to speak ill of other groups. And so, he's God. He made you and me. It's not like it's a big surprise. He knows how we act. He knows the ways our flesh respond. 
He knows the kinds of attitudes and, and the patterns that we will naturally default to. And so his word gives us wisdom as to know how to bring justice in a way that really makes a difference. Um, when justice is blind, there is security and there's peace. I want to share with you a story, um, again, another illustration of, of justice, and it's about two men. Uh, the first man is Reverend Wade Watts. Reverend Wade Watts um, is a black man from Oklahoma, and he knew Martin Luther King He Jr. He took part in his marches. He, he's been a, a big um, advocate for civil rights in America. And then the other one is Johnny Clary. And Johnny Clary was um, the grand poobah or whatever it is in the Ku Klux Klan um, in that area in Oklahoma. And a radio station asked uh, Reverend Watts and um, Johnny Clary if they would come to the radio station and debate on air. Well, that day, uh, Johnny Clary was in the radio station and Reverend Watts came in the door and, and he surprised Johnny because Johnny... Uh, he was dressed real nice. He was, he was a minister. He's got a Bible with him. He looks very sharp. Um, Reverend Watts comes in, and he approaches Johnny real fast and quickly. He sticks out his hand, grabs his hand, shakes his hand, and says, Mr. Clary, I'm pleased to meet you. I want to come here today to make sure I told you that God loves you, and so do I. And at that point, uh, Johnny realizes what has just happened to him, that he's holding a black man's hand, and he yanks his hand back because the Ku Klux Klan has a law against that, that they, if they touch a person of color, they've been polluted. And so he pulls his hand back, um, and, and um, at that point, uh, he sees uh, Johnny's face, and he goes, don't worry, Johnny, it doesn't come off. And then um, at the end of their debate, uh, when they're all finished, um, Mr. Watts brings Johnny over and introduces him to his nine-year-old little niece and to his wife, and they're raising their niece. And he turns to Johnny and says, Johnny, is there any good reason that you should hate my little niece? And he says to Johnny, Johnny, you know, there is nothing you can do and there is nothing you can say that ever keep me from loving you. God loves you and I love you too. After that day on the radio station, um, Mr. Watts was the Ku Klux Klan's number one target. They couldn't stand him because Johnny's the one in charge. So what do they do? The first thing they do is throw trash on his yard, and um, that doesn't bother him. He didn't get mad about that or anything. So they put their hoods and their capes on, and they come, and they all surround his house. And he comes out in the front yard, and, and he says, Hey, Johnny, it's great to see you, man. He said, You know, you folks are here four months early, though. It is not Halloween yet. I don't have any tricks or treats for you. You come back in four months, and I'll do you good, all right? And he turns around and walks back in his house. And he doesn't let it bother him. All the clan turns to Johnny and says, All right, Johnny, good, great idea. What are we going to do now? So they burn a cross in the yard across the street from him. And Mr. Watts comes out in the front yard and he says, Hey, Johnny, um, you guys got enough hamburgers and hot dogs and mush marshmallows for that barbecue you going on here? He turns around and goes back in his house and he doesn't let it bother him. Again, they turn to Johnny, all right, Mr. Bright Guy, what do we do now? They decide they're going to burn his church down. But the firemen come quick, and they put the fire out. So Johnny gets on the phone, and he calls Mr. Watts, and he says, you don't know who we are, but we know who you are, and we're coming for you, and you better be scared. Mr. Watts goes, hey, Johnny, it's so great for you to take time to give me a call. I'd like to do you a favor. God? I love Johnny, and you love Johnny. Would you please forgive Johnny for being so stupid? And would you please bless him? Because he seems to need attention. He needs attention. Help him. And then Johnny hangs up the phone. Well, Johnny doesn't know what to do. They've been following Mr. Watts, and they finally decide. Uh, they see him go into a restaurant. And so they send in 30 Ku Klux Klan. They surround his table, and Johnny approaches the table, and he says, um, Boy... We don't like your kind, and we don't want you in this restaurant. This restaurant's for white people. He says, you think real hard and long about what you're going to do, because he's got a, a chicken in front of me. You think real hard and long about what you're going to do to that chicken. Because whatever you do to that chicken, we're going to do to you. And Mr. Watts, he looks around, thinks for just a second. 
He grabs that chicken and he pulls it up and he kisses it. And at that point, everybody in the restaurant starts doing what you just did. They start laughing. And then the, clu- the clan starts laughing at Johnny <laughs> because it's so funny. He gets ticked off. He says, everybody out of here. I you shut up, shut up. You know, and they all walk out and he starts yelling at them, telling them he's going to take their robes away for laughing. And they said, but it was funny. You got to admit it was funny. And at that point, Mr. Watts drives by, honks his horn and says, bye, Johnny. Bye. And that was the last day the Ku Klux Klan did anything to Reverend Watts. Because he loved them and he cherished them. They were enemies, but he loved them with the justice of God, not with the justice of man. You know, eventually, Johnny Clary's life just, just it rock bottomed. I mean, it was destroyed. And he was desperate. And when he was desperate, he came to the Lord. And once he came back to the Lord, he, and, and he knew that Mr. Watts was a part of why he came back to the Lord. And so he looked Mr. Watts up. And together, the two of them began to do ministry together. Um, he became a minister as well. And they shared the gospel together, but they also shared the fact that, that God wants reconciliation. He wants unity within the body of Christ. He wants unity within our country. And they did everything that they could together in order to make that happen. One day, Johnny turned to um, Mr. Watson. He said, I know because of the love of God and the forgiveness of Jesus is why, but, but what was it that gave you the strength to be able to, to love me the way that you did? How, what kind of helped you get to that place? He said, Johnny, when I was a little boy, um, the mother of my best friend, who was a white boy, did something mean and cruel to me. I went back home and I said, Daddy, you know, why would she do something like that to me? And he said, um, he said, son, there are some people that have a disease. That disease is racism and it's hate. And it's a disease. It's a sickness. And it's important for you to know, um, little Wade, that when you encounter somebody that hates you that way and has that disease, are you mean to people that are sick? No, you're not mean to them. Because if you are, then you get the disease too. And so you make sure that you love and care for them and you feel for them and you have compassion for them. Everyone must be treated with equality, dignity, and honor. That's what the Lord has designed us for. It's the way his precepts are very clear. That's what he's called us to do and to be. The third point as you look at your answer is this. I'm sometimes responsible for the sins of my community. I'm sometimes responsible for the sins of my community. Now, what does that mean? Um, I want, we need to go back in history, back to the times of the Old Testament and the nation of Israel. God had, the, from the very beginning, told the nation of Israel, if they're obedient to his commands, that he will bless them, they will be a blessing to the entire world. Um, if they turn their backs on him, though, and they worship idols, and they do other things, and they sin, then eventually, then there's going to be curses that are occur, and they're going to be taken into captivity. Well, Israel did it. Uh, it. It went on for hundreds of years, and generation after generation, and finally Israel was destroyed, the northern kingdom. Um, they, the Assyrians took them off, and then eventually Judah uh, made the same mistakes long enough that God's mercy finally said, okay, you're going to go into captivity too, and they went into to Babylon into captivity. While they were in captivity, Daniel is one of the young men that is taken captive and taken, and he works his way up into the government. He is a godly young man who lives his life according to the precepts of God. He has fear for the Lord. He loves the Lord. Um, But he also knows that Jeremiah, the prophet, has given a prophecy that after 70 years that the people of Israel will come back to their land, that they'll be restored and they'll come back there. And so he knows that 70 years are are approaching. It's getting close. And so he goes to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to read part of that prayer, not the whole thing, but part of it. Pay close attention to it. And remember that Daniel is one of the holiest men from the Old Testament, one of the holiest men probably that's ever lived, a godly man. And this is the prayer that he prayed. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed... Ah, Lord, 
the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. We have sinned, done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled, and turned away from your commands and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, leaders, ancestors, and all the people of the land. Lord, righteousness belongs to you. But this day, public shame belongs to us. The men of Judah, the residents of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are near and those who are far, in all the countries where you have banished them. Now, up until this point, he's talked solely we in, in, in an inclusive way where he's a part of it. But then he begins to talk, talk more about the leaders and, and those that have done wrong and have been banished. But he comes back to it. Because of the disloyalty they have shown toward you. Lord, public shame belongs to us, our kings, our leaders, and our ancestors. Because we have sinned against you. Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God. Though we have rebelled against him. And have not obeyed the Lord our God by following his instructions that he set before us through his servants, the prophets. So Daniel, one of the holiest, godliest men in the nation of Israel and the world probably in its history, is confessing all the sins of Israel, his people. It's his community. And to some degree or shape or form, it's his responsibility. And he understands that. That because he's a part of that community, to some degree, it's a community-wide responsibility. Here in America, in particular, we understand what that's like. We, we live in a democratic republic. The truth of the matter is, every single one of us has tremendous freedom and influence in the lives of other people. When we speak, um, it makes a difference in people's lives. Again, we were created to, to create, and, and, and language is part of what that, that responsibility is. We have the ability to impact people, but that means... Even the most innocent of us is also, to some degree or another, guilty of the same sins that our our country, our city, our church may have committed. And we need to take responsibility for that. We need to be humble like Daniel was. And we need to care about the community that we're a part of to the degree that we're willing to go to God on their behalf. He fasted and prayed during this time period. It was a serious burden on his heart. He wanted God to respond. He wanted things to be different for the people of God. Sometimes the more innocent share in suffering for the sins of the community. Daniel is one of those that did that. If we're a part of a community, we do have impact and influence. Um. This has nothing to do with identity groups within the nation. It has everything to do with being a member of our nation. Even though Daniel, in this case, was more innocent, it was still legitimate. How does this work for us? To some degree, God holds us responsible for the actions of our country. Now, I'm I'm just going to name two things. I'm sure there are all sorts of things that have come to your mind. And and as I name these, I want you to remember the fact that that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is the the most gracious, tender-hearted expression to sinners that there is, that there ever has been or ever will be, that God always is willing to forgive any. But in America, um, we have chosen to create an industry that kills babies. 60 million babies have been aborted in America since um, we've made it legal. There are atheists that have joined the pro-life movement. You know why they say that? They say, we're the only animal that kills its young. And even atheists can figure out, this isn't a good deal. It isn't the right thing to do. We need to do the right thing. Our responsibility for what's gone on in the country of Af- I mean, uh, Afghanistan. We have some significant level of responsibility for people that we've left there, people, and, the, pe- and the, Im- the huge impact that it's left on the country and the ways in which we've left it. We have some responsibility for that. We need to take it seriously. 
We need to use the freedoms that we have in order to influence and to create change wherever possible. Um, the fourth point that I want to share with you, oh, I'm sorry. To what degree are we responsible? What is it really like? Remember, Daniel goes to the Lord in prayer. He's fasting. And the Lord sends an angel to Daniel. And this is, what the, angel, this is the way the angel describes him. He says, he says, you are a man treasured by God. Because he had a heart for his country and for his community. And he wanted justice. He wanted, he wanted the goodness and the blessing of God. We need to be a treasure to our God because we care and take responsibility. The fourth point, I'm ultimately responsible for my sins, but not all my results. I'm ultimately responsible for my sins, but not all my results. And this one, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, I'm just going to read that one verse, um, but pay close attention to it. Ezekiel 18 has got tons of theology in it. I encourage you to read it sometime, but... The person who sins is the one who will die. All right. Ezekiel. What is he talking about? Ezekiel is a prophet during the last days, uh, during this Babylonian exile. So is, is he talking about executions? Because they do have certain penalties as a nation that Israel had for certain sins and crimes. But pretty much they never really enforced those. And this is during the Babylonian exile. So what is he talking about when he talks about dying? What he's talking about is spiritually. What he's talking about is our souls and the effect of our sin. The person who sins is the one who will die. A son won't suffer punishment for his, the father's iniquity. And a father won't suffer punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous person will be on him. And the wickedness of the wicked person will be on him. Do we belong to this community? And are we, do we have some level of responsibility and guilt associated with being a part of it? Yes. But the ultimate responsibility for our sin falls at our feet individually, each one of us. Even family units um, don't overpower uh, that responsibility. Our responsibility is straight between us and the Lord. That's why the scriptures in Romans chapter 3, 23 say... For all have fallen short of the glory, the goodness, the beauty, and the, and the brilliance of Jesus. And the wages of sin is death. That's what the scriptures are talking about. Individually, we're responsible for our own personal sin. Um, but what do I mean by not all my results? The Bible is full of examples of suffering that has nothing to do with the evil and sin of others or our sin. And evil. It just has to do with the fall of, hum, uh, of humanity and the impacts of the fall in this world. Sometimes just bad things happen. And we've got to understand that and realize because of the fall, we live in a, in a world that groans and longs for the return of Jesus to make the creation right and good again. I want to share with you a quote by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And Solzhenitsyn um, was a, just a phenomenal man, a, a brilliant man, but um, one who resisted and, and gave a hard time to the czars, and then he resisted and gave a hard time uh, to communism. And he, he grew up in a Christian home, but he probably wasn't a believer until he was sent to the gulag. And, and in that experience, he experienced and encountered grace. He experienced Jesus and understood who he was. And this is what Sultan Nietzsche says. He says, if only it were all so simple, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds. All right, now let's, let's stop a minute here. He, he grew up in the times of Stalin, all right? He could have found some evil people to round up and kill. Um, he knew what was going on, but he says more. What else does he say? And it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who's willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Sultan Nietzsche had, had seen his own sin. And that sin had humbled him. 
And he understood that ultimately the cross is the only place to experience real justice. And, and it's the only one that gives wisdom and insight to know how to establish relationships and societies and communities where justice is real. And it makes a difference in people's hearts and lives. And, and isn't it interesting? He says, and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? What did Jesus say? If you want to be my disciple, what do you have to do? You have to take up your cross, that instrument of death. You have to deny yourself. And you have to follow him and be like him. And the only way you can do that is through the Holy Spirit. You've got to have an encounter with God. And he gives you that. He, he makes himself real to you. He helps you deny yourself. He helps you take that instrument of death that sacrifices and crucifies the arrogance and the pride and the unforgiveness that so easily becomes a part of who we are. Jesus can and he wants to do that for each one of us. He wants us to know that kind of strength and that kind of living. Number five, the last point, God and I have a special interest and concern for the poor and suffering. God and I have a special interest and concern for the poor and suffering. Two passages of scripture, Isaiah 1, 17, learn to do what is good, pursue justice, correct the oppressor, defend the rights of the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. In Jeremiah 22, 3, this is what the Lord says, administer justice and righteousness, Rescue the victim of robbery from his oppressor. Don't exploit or brutalize the resident alien, the fatherless, or the widow. Don't shed innocent blood in this place. God's called you and me to have his same heart. He has always had a heart for the poor and the downtrodden, those that are hurting, those whose hearts have been wounded and bruised, those that are struggling. His vision and focus is on them. He wants you and me to have that same vision and focus. He wants to make sure we do everything to, to encourage and to help, to correct oppressors and relieve those that are being oppressed and mistreated. He's called you and me to act and respond with the same level of kindness and courage and humility that he has. I'm going to close with a video clip. It, it relates to Operation Christmas Child, but it, it's one that I think um, is relevant for what we've been talking about, as well as what we want to do this Christmas as we celebrate and as we give generously and as we touch and care for little ones. I've had a, an interesting upbringing. In my journey, I've experienced God's love in the form of people reaching out when they don't have to, to tangibly demonstrate God's love. That love along the way has been unconditional, never ending, generous, always giving, powerful love that has changed hearts and most personally, my, my very own. My family is originally from Rwanda. In July of 1994, a lot of the you know, chaos started and uh, uh, Hutus were killing Tutsis, Tutsis killing Hutus. My mom was eight months pregnant. They had just built a new house and my dad realized that with two young boys and one daughter, they need to get out. And that's when they decided to flee to the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I was born a month later there. Then after that, we bounced around the world because we had nowhere else to go. And that's when we moved to Togo. So I was a refugee for 14 years of my life. I've never met any of my, my grandparents, uh, my uncles, my cousins. Many of them were were killed. And it's not just my family. A million people fell in the span of 100 days in the Rwandan genocide. Knowing that fact broke me as a kid. 
I was weary of humanity because I knew what they were capable of, the evil they were capable of. And I harbored a hatred for them, a radical hatred for them. I grew up calling myself a Christian, uh, but my faith wasn't my own. It was my, my parents. My parents there were, were pastors in Togo and uh, heard the gospel, read the Bible, but none of it re reached me, really. Because of hardened heart, pride, just hatred, over and over I walked away from God's love, but he, he was always there. You know, something that changed the course of my life was my first gift, the first gift I'd ever received. As I opened the shoebox, the items in there were incredible. The first thing I remember pulling out was a scarf, a scarf that I still have. There was a red toy car in my box. That was my favorite item that day. At the very top was a sticky note. The words on that sticky note read, God loves you, Jesus loves you, I love you. Now, I had heard the first two lines before, but that last one wrecked me because it was an I love you from a member of that very humanity I grew up hating. And they were telling me, essentially, Eve, despite your hatred for me, I love you anyway, man. And here's proof of my love for you in the form of the first and only gift you've ever received. That shook my world to the core. God began to use that sticky note to start working on my heart. It didn't happen overnight. I'm still a work in progress. His love never left our side. His ever-flowing, never-ending, always-giving, generous, powerful love. And then a shoebox gift. That's what God used to free me from the burdens of hatred. I have never been the same because of that shoebox that still continues to change my life. Something as simple as um, a shoebox full of gifts uh, can make a, a difference and an impact in children's lives. And that's something that's important. It's something that we want to be focused on. But what we're also talking about, we're talking about something much deeper and much broader. It has to do with the way that we look at life and the way that we look at other people and the way that, that we make judgments and, and that we allow the Spirit of God to be the thing that determines that and directs us. You know, um, here at the church, one of the, the new rules that we've got is called the 10-foot rule. And the 10-foot rule means if you see somebody you don't know within 10 feet of you, it's your talent, your obligation to go talk to that person, to get connected with them the best that you can if they're not a member here yet, for you to get to know them and help try and get them connected um, in any way that you can. Not be worrying about whether um, you know, they may have been here for 20 years and you just didn't know them. That's okay. Now you know them, all right? And, and you guys get to talk to one another. But uh, we want to be that kind of community. We want the blood of Christ to so transform our hearts that we live according to the justice of God and not according to the ways this world operates. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we bow before you this day and thank you for your presence here. We thank you for the ways in which you've worked in us and you've been speaking to us and teaching us. We pray that you'd be glorified and honored. Help us, Lord God, to worship you and to live according to your principles of justice and not anything that comes to our mind or head or, or the, that we kind of scrap together from all sorts of things that other people have told us. But instead to look to the one that's made us and the one that has the credibility of having been the most humble and given up the most for us. And Father, if there's anybody here who's never taken a step to be your disciple and wants to do that today and needs to do that today and your spirit's been wooing them, help them to pray these simple words to say, Lord, 
I know I need you, and I know that my own pride and selfishness have kept me from you, my sins. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for those sins. In his name, I ask you to forgive me and fill me, that you come into me and give me new thoughts and a heart, and that you'd help me to live for you and to serve you, and that you'd help me to be a part of your kingdom and your justice in that kingdom. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your presence here today. Amen. As you're prepared and ready and able, um, we're going to sing uh, as we worship God in song. And as, as you've prayerfully and carefully thought, um, please bring your pledge cards to this basket up here during this song. Let's stand and worship God in song together. <laughs>
Please be seated. Is there anyone who doesn't have elements? All right, we did good, didn't we? As we come to this place of redemption and forgiveness, let's bow our heads and hearts before God and confess silently any sin that the Spirit may have brought to your heart and mind. Father, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for being here present today. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you that you gave it so freely and at such great cost. We trust you. We give you our lives. and We pray you would help us, Father, to be faithful. Allow you to, to minister to us and make us the children you want us to be. In Jesus' precious and loving name we pray. Amen. Let's continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we bow before you and thank you for the ways in which you have pursued humanity from the very beginning. Lord, from the garden where Adam and Eve, you loved and cared and cherished them. And that time in, in the cool of the evening you always wanted to be a part of. Thank you for the ways in which you have set yourself a people apart, that people that were to bring Christ, your son, the Savior, that people that were to be and are a blessing to the entire world. Thank you for the ways that you've spoken into our lives so that we have seen who he is and understood and that he's become our Messiah. Father, thank you for this great salvation in Christ. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Father, we bow before you and remember that night that Jesus instituted this table where he put it together for his, his best friends. And spoke to them and told them to remember everything that he did and was doing for them. Help us, Lord God, to remember and to know that it's real. And that Jesus died for my sins. The ones that I have committed in recent days. And that his blood washes them clean. And gives me freedom and strength to serve you. Help each one of us, Lord to be nourished at this table today. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, we know that we are absolutely dependent upon your spirit. And so we ask that you fill us with your spirit that you would change us and make us, that you'd speak to us this week in the ways we need to hear you, and that you give us the ability to, to care and make difficult, hard decisions. And Lord, we pray that you'd also knit us together as brothers and sisters, and that we would love one another, and that we would treasure each other. And as we leave here, we would continue to do that, but we would also extend that love and that, that care to those that are outside these walls, that desperately need to know that the God who made us is the light of the world, and he wants to light in up their lives. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for what you're doing in us. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Jesus chose to give his body 
for you so that you would know and, and your confidence in his love would never be shaken. He allowed his blood to be poured out as a sign of the new covenant, but also of the fact that he would pour his spirit into each one of us, that he would live with us and abide with us, and that he would make us into the ones he wants us to be. If you would get your elements ready, we'll start with the body, the bread. And remember, the body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Lord, thank you for this table. Thank you for this special place that you give us, Lord, to come and meet with you and for you to meet with us and for you to touch us. Thank you for that touch. Thank you for your strength. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing freely, freely. Um, as you're able, uh, please stand and worship God in song. See these words of blessing and truth. What does God expect of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. He's walked more humbly than any other can. Trust him, be filled with his spirit, and be at peace. Amen.